Pháp dương vô thượng tôn tam giới vô luân thấp Thiên nhân chi đạo sư tử sanh chi từ phù Ư ừ, nhất niềm quy năng diệt tam kỳ nghiệp Sướng dương nhược tán tháng ức kiếp mạc năng thần Nam Mô Bổn Sư Thích Ca Môn Ni Phật We start the lecture with the reading of the Sutra. Subhuti When a Bodhisattva does work for the benefits of beings, he should not have the thought of being a giver or someone as a receiver. The Tathagata declares that all forms are not really forms. Similarly, All living beings are not really living beings, but temporarily called all beings. Ajidafat. As in past lectures, when I talk about doing charity, if you saw someone receive your offer or saw yourself as being the giver, then you were stuck on your ego which this sutra wants to eliminate. This emphasizes that a bodhisattva does not retain the four forms which are ego, human, all beings, and lifespan limits. When you do an offering without these four forms, then your blessings are indescribable. You can use this blessing and dedicate it toward your practice so you could have enough credit to reach complete awakening and liberation. And vice versa. If you do an offering with the mental appearances of the giver and the recipient, then this act came from a small mind in which this blessing is limited, and it does not belong in the causeless world but be a part of the future rebirth in the six realms. Therefore, when you practice the Diamond Sutra, then you should keep your mind quiet without initiating a thought or preconceived ideas. Also, in this section, the Buddha reminded Subhuti about the forms. Although there are many forms in this world which we can see with our eyes, but are they true forms? If they are true forms, then it could not be destroyed. But since they are not everlasting, then they are fake forms or temporarily called forms. They are dependent on their karmic connection in which they come or go grow or die. I mentioned to you last time that the Buddha often used the three phrases to present the true forms of the mind. Those of you who truly understood those three phrases, then you have elevated yourself to Bodhisattva level. The Buddha also said, all living beings are not really living beings but temporarily call all beings. Here again are the three phrases that the Buddha used. So why are all beings not really all beings? It is because they are not everlasting, but come and go due to their circumstances. We were not born awake, but have to go through countless rebirths, delusions, and sufferings in order to have a chance to wake up to our true nature. As you can see, our nature changes from one being to another. So we are temporarily called all beings. A true being does not change through time or circumstances. These three phrases are meant for you to contemplate upon until you can see its true form. This sutra has given birth to countless Buddhas because it directly points to the true forms. Blessed are those who can hear this sutra 
because he can see his true form if only he does what was instructed in the sutra Ajita Phat Now we go back to the sutra text Subhuti The Tathagata declares the truth, the fundamentals He does not declare lies or that which is incorrect The Tathagata has attained the truth but it is neither real nor false Ajita The word Tathagata alone represents a character that does not change, which in itself does not contain falsehood. In the character that neither create nor destroy, there is no room for falsehood. There exists only the fundamental character of the universe. The Buddha also said, the Tathagata has attained the truth but it is neither real nor false. We use the word attainment here because that is needed for communication. But in the Tathagata's character of neither creation nor destruction, how can there be an attainment, which in its meaning represents a process of creation or generation? This characteristic is also the fundamental of our pure mind. It neither create nor destroy, neither pure nor impure, and neither increases nor decrease. As declared in the Heart Sutra, which most of you recite each night. So when someone said that he practiced and has attained something, He is only using words to temporarily describe, but in reality, the pure mind does not attain anything. If you want to enter the pure mind, you have to do the actual practice. Here is a phrase that some ancient master said, I can do many things to help all beings, but there are five things that I cannot do for them, which are eat, drink, defecate, urinate, and become enlightened. No masters or Buddhas can do these things for you. Have the Buddhas able to force you to become enlightened? Then this world right here would have been a Buddha world already. So if you practice, then you will have the chance to wake up. But if you use words to describe or only go through mental understanding, then you will be standing outside and not be a part of the Buddha world. You can use words to describe attainment or realization, but within the Buddha mind, there is no attainment or realization. Namo Bosu Thitka Monifat. Now back to the Sutra text. Subhuti. If a bodhisattva practices charity with his mind filled with preconceived thought, then it is like a man in a dark room and sees nothing. Whereas if he practices charity without preconceived notions, then he is like a man with open eyes in a room filled with radiant sunlight and sees clearly all objects. Namo Bonsu Thitka Monifa. Here is the third time the Buddha reminded us how to practice charity. If the person who practices charity still recognizes the giver and the recipient, then he is still deluded by his ego, covering up his diamond prajna wisdom. He is like someone who has entered a dark room. This means that even though you did the charity, but the blessing from it could not open up your prasna wisdom. This is a limited blessing, not an unlimited blessing. A person who enters a dark room does not have the wisdom to recognize the true character of his mind. However, if that person practices charity, but does not have the four wrong views of ego entity, human, other beings, 
and lifespan limit biases. Then he has attained the diamond prasna parameter focus, which would allow the true form of your mind to appear right away. He has entered his inner mind and saw the true forms of all things. It is like someone who saw clearly everything in the room once the light was turned on. This is an important concept to learn, which was why the Buddha mentioned it for the third time already. If you can eliminate these four wrong views, then your compassion for all beings will have no limit. Whereas if these views still remain, then it is the source of greed, anger, and ignorance which dilute your mind and drop you within the sixth world of rebirth. Namo Ajidafa. Now back to the Sutra text. Subhuti. The Tathagata uses the Buddha wisdom, knows for certain in the future, if there are good men or women who study, understand, and recite this discourse, the immeasurable blessing will be fruitful. Namo Monsutikamonifa. This is the sixth time that the Buddha reminded us about immeasurable blessings bestowed on those who understand, practice, and recite the Sutra. Of all the blessings, none is more important than the one involving the understanding and practice of the teaching in this Diamond Sutra. Earned blessings or merit are generated by the understanding and implementation of the precepts, whereas the fortunate blessing are generated by charitable acts, which could bring you blessing that you can use within the worlds of your future rebirth. Fortunate blessings cannot help you achieve supreme wisdom or enlightenment. Earned blessings are derived from your character development and meditative practices, which are unlimited in nature and transcend beyond the grasp of rebirth. You also study, understand, and practice the teaching of this sutra. Reciting every day without understanding the sutra is not good enough because this will not help you overcome the three poisons of greed, anger, and ignorance in order to liberate yourself. Namo Bonsu Tika Monifa. Now back to the sutra text. Subhuti. If there is good men or good women who in the morning use his life as much as the sands in the Ganges River to sacrifice in charitable acts, and as much in the noontime, and likewise as much in the evening time, and continuously doing so for millions of ages, and then compare this to someone who listened to this discourse and believes without doubt then the latter is more blessed than the former. It is even more incomparable if the latter could write, understand, recite, and explain it to others. Namo Bonsu Thitka Monifa As you all have heard, this is the seventh time that the Buddha has praised the blessing of the Sutra. I have also explained before the blessings of those who gave in alms the seven treasures in great quantity as the great chiliocosm, but still are not as blessed as those who understood and practiced the sutra. Why is that? You should all remember that this is a Mahayana sutra that can reveal the Buddha nature of each being. And only those who have practiced in the past could have enough karmic connection to understand and follow this sutra. For those who have not practiced in the past, then there is no way for you to understand this sutra and believe in it. 
when you study something that is at your level, you would be very happy. When you understand it and feel that you are making good progress. But when you encounter a subject matter that is difficult for you to comprehend, you would feel stuck, and after a while, want to give up. When you talk about the blessings of people who do endless charitable acts, then it is already great. But for someone who has faith in the sutra, the blessing is even greater. Why? It is because this sutra directly points to the pure mind, to the tathagata nature of all beings. Even more than having faith, is that if you were able to understand and translate or lecture this sutra to others, then the blessings are even greater and immeasurable. The monk who can lecture this sutra have tremendous blessing. But whatever blessing they attain, they would transfer or dedicate it to all being. Likewise, as I sit here explaining the meaning of this sutra, I dedicate my blessing to all those who are in this room, to all the beings in the great chilio cosm, Ayidafa. Now back to the sutra text. Subhuti. For those who follow the Mahayana paths and those who follow the Supreme Path, the Tathagata declares this discourse most beneficial to them. The Tathagata knows clearly that if there is someone who studies, recites, and explains these sutras, then his blessing is immeasurable and indescribable. He shall be successful following the Tathagata's way. Subhuti Those who follow the Theravada or small vehicle path still have bias based on the four forms, will not understand, believe, recite, or explain this sutra to others. Ayidafa As you have heard, this sutra was presented for those who practice the Mahayana path, like the Bodhisattvas, or those who practice the Supreme Path, like the Buddhas. So, for those of you who are listening to this lecture, you are not the one who practiced the small vehicle path. You have been practicing the big vehicle path in order to have enough blessing to have a chance to hear of this Diamond Sutra. Furthermore, the Buddha stated for someone who practices, understand and explain it to others, that his blessing has no end and no boundaries. The blessing could not be calculated or measured. And then this person shall attain the fruit of Nirvana and Bodhi-mind of the Tathagata. For those who follow the small vehicle path, they still have biases on the four forms of ego entity, human, all beings, and lifespan limit. So they could not comprehend, believe, recite, or explain this sutra to others. The person who practices the small vehicle path can only save himself by studying and practicing for his own benefit. But if he took what he learned and achieved and explained and helped others to achieve, then he has crossed over to the big vehicle path. The highest achievement for the person who practices small vehicle path is Arhathood. When compared to Buddhahood, Arhathood is still very far. The Buddha nature of the Tathagata is what is described in this sutra. Only those who follow the Mahayana path or the Supreme Path can have a mind that is compatible with this sutra. 
a mind that is in sync with the Buddha nature. Arhat's mind is still far away. Namo Motsu Thitka Munifat. Now back to the Sutra text. Subhuti. Wherever this Sutra is revered or worshipped, then that is where the Buddha's temple should be located and all the gods, men and titans should come to pay respect and make offerings. This sutra represents a great and most valuable wisdom, and a monk who can explain or lecture this sutra should already have some prajna wisdom in him already. Therefore, a place that has the sutra being worshipped and lectured is a sacred place where awakening and liberation could take place. This sutra represents the highest truth, which can help not only man, but gods and titans as well. They all want to come to learn and improve themselves through the understanding of this sutra. All of you here in this room have the Mahayana mind, who want to learn and be awakened to liberation. Likewise, the gods and titans also want to be liberated by the teaching of this sutra, so they will be most respectful and supportive to any place that has the sutra explained or worshipped. I knew of several monks who, all of their lives, practiced and studied no other sutra besides this Diamond Sutra. The day they die, they enter a high level of their practices. If you are willing to make an effort to practice the teaching of this sutra, then for the beginners, it probably takes three years, or for the advanced, it probably takes one year to understand the true meaning of this sutra. The 33rd Zen Patriarch, Huai Nang, rely on this Diamond Sutra to fully realize the deepest character of the true form. The blessing derived from this sutra is supreme. Now we continue on with the sutra text. Furthermore, Subhuti, if there is good man or woman who studies, practices, and recites this sutra, but is ridiculed and disdained by people, then due to his past karmic retribution, he should have been in an unfortunate situation, but instead, due to his practices and negative perception from others, his bad karma is now erased and he can attain supreme enlightenment. Namo Motsu Thitka Monifa. As you all should know, after you have practiced and become a monk for a while, then you would have attained good blessings already. And when you speak, most people would respect your commitment and virtues and want to be near you in order to learn more Buddhist teachings. But this section said the opposite, where you are a monk and have studied and practiced the sutra teaching, and yet was ridiculed by others. Then this disdain by others was the result of the blessings you gained from studying and practicing the sutra's teaching, alleviating your negative karmic deeds of the past. You should be happy to be disdained by others, because this shows your karmic debt was great, and you were supposed to be in a dire situation in this life. But now, you have overcome it with your practice. Once your past debt have been eliminated, then your merit will start to grow positively, and help you to realize the body mind. If you are on the path, don't be sad when things do not go your way because you are evolving and paying your debt and will eventually get better. 
There are practitioners who have attained Arhat level already. But when they go to beg for alms, no one would offer them anything. This is an example of karmic death. Or did not attain enough merit in past life with fellow beings. So in the following lifetime, he got no offering. Similarly, there are masters who were enlightened and living in the temples, but got no worshippers coming by to support them. They would sometimes do Dharma teachings for the gods or spirit to hear, since no humans were stopping by. This is an example of not enough blessing or karmic connection with fellow beings. So don't feel despair when things don't go your way. The higher, the farther you go, the more pressure you will get to test your faith and commitment. As long as you are truly practicing and persevere, you are evolving for the better. Ajidafa. Now back to the Sutra text. Subhuti. In the last period of the Buddha Kalpa, if a good man or woman studies, practices, and recites this sutra, his blessing would be complete. But the hearers would not understand, have doubts, and not believe. Subhuti. You should know that the deep meaning of the sutra cannot be debated, and likewise, its blessing is beyond discussion. Ayyidafat This is the twelfth time that the Buddha reminded us of the great blessing that come out of the sutra if study and practice. This blessing is so great that he continued to pray so that all beings can be motivated to learn and practice. He mentioned it the first time, but was concerned that all beings would forget. He then reminded the second, third, and on and on until this twelfth time, so we won't forget. You can see that he has great compassion for all beings, to keep reminding us so many times of this sutra's importance. Whoever studies and practices, we have such great blessing that if you told someone about it, that person would become disoriented, have doubts, and not believe, because it would sound illogical and unreasonable to him. The Buddha concluded this section by saying, The blessing is beyond discussion. Namo Bosu Thitka Monifa Now back to the Sutra text. At that moment, Venerable Subhuti asked for the second time, Woe on the one, if a good man or good woman inspires to seek the supreme enlightenment, how should he abide and how should he control his mind? The Buddha replied, If a good man or good woman inspires to seek the supreme enlightenment, then he must have this commitment in his mind. I must liberate all beings, and once they have all been liberated, I saw no being yet liberated. Why is that? Subhuti. If a bodhisattva still sees ego entity, humans, all beings, and lifespan limit, then he is not a bodhisattva. Why? It is because in reality, there is no method to attain the Supreme Enlightenment. Namo Bhutsu This is the second time that Venerable Subhuti brought up these questions. In reality, for an Arhat like Subhuti, whatever the Buddha said, he could understand. But because he wanted to help future beings to clearly understand, he brought it up again. The Buddha said that when we practice, we should not only save ourselves, but must save all beings without discrimination, 
of who is good or bad, religion or races. As long as that being has the karmic connection to know you and could hear and practice what you recommended, then you are obligated to help him. And in the process of using all dharmas to help, you should not think that you are helping him and that he is your student. If you do think that way, then your mind is at a low level, because that is not the mind of a bodhisattva, but is the mind of a commoner. If you help but you don't see the helper, or the one being saved, then that is a bodhisattva, because you are not seeing the four forms. If you declare that you are a bodhisattva, then you are not a bodhisattva, because bodhisattva does not see the four forms. If you have taken the bodhisattva precept, then you are just a bodhisattva in name only, not a real one. Even when you said that you want to seek the bodhi mind and think that there is a method to do this, then you are not in sync with the Tathagata's mind. A body mind is just a word to describe. There is no such thing. Similarly, a pure mind, a Buddha mind are just words to describe to someone who is talking with you, so he could understand. You yourself should not be stuck on those words. Namo Bosu Titka Now back to the Sutra text. Subhuti, what do you think? When the Tathagata was with Limpakara Buddha, was there a method for attaining the incomparable supreme enlightenment? Well, honored one, no, from my understanding of the Tathagata's teaching, there was no formula for attaining the incomparable supreme enlightenment. When you were with the Dipankara Buddha, the Buddha said, correct, Correct. Truly, there was no formula which the Tathagata used to attain the incomparable supreme enlightenment. Subhuti, if there was a formula for the Tathagata to attain the incomparable supreme enlightenment, then the Dipankara Buddha would not have predicted regarding me. In the future, you will become the Buddha called Sakyamuni. Subhuti. The Tathagata itself means the Absolute. Some said the Tathagata attained the fruit of the incomparable Supreme Enlightenment. But in reality, there is no formula which the Tathagata attained the incomparable Supreme Enlightenment. Subhuti. The incomparable supreme enlightenment of the Tathagata is neither real nor unreal. Namo Bhutsu Thitka Monifa. This section is difficult to understand for some of you. I will go through it closely. Subhuti, in the past, was there a method for attaining the incomparable supreme enlightenment? The term Tathagata itself means absolute, eternal, no changing. So how can there be a method to become the Tathagata? This line clearly defines the Dharma body of the Buddha. If there is a method for the Buddha to become the Tathagata, then the Buddha was an ordinary being, not the Tathagata. Do you see that? Subhuti understood this concept and right away answered no. Advanced beings understand each other where commoners could not. If the Tathagata went through the process to attain the incomparable supreme enlightenment, then the Tathagata was an ordinary being and had an ego entity form. How could the Dipankara Buddha predict the coming of the future Buddha, Sakyamuni, if that was the case? 
you also think deeply about this. The Diamond Sutra is miraculous. Those of you who really want to study and practice toward the goal of liberating yourself must study this sutra. Its meaning is magical. Trying to present the Dharma body, the true form of the Tathagata to the eyes of all beings. Regarding some who say that the Tathagata attained the fruit of the Buddhahood, how can that be? The Tathagata symbolized no coming or going, no increase or decrease. So there is really nothing new to attain. If you said that the Tathagata attained this or that, then you really don't understand Buddha Dharma. If you are stuck on the physical form, then you will not be able to comprehend this concept. This is why this sutra was meant for Mahayana or Supreme Level Practitioner. Those that have seen a glimpse of their Dharma body already would be able to comprehend it, while those who are Arhat level or below would not. Namo Bhutsu Tikka Moni Phat. Now back to the Sutra text. Subhuti. The Tathagata declares that all Dharmas are Buddha Dharmas. Subhuti. All Dharmas are not really Dharmas, but just temporarily called Dharmas. Similarly, the Buddha body is not really big and tall, but just temporarily called big and tall. Agidata. Again, you have to contemplate these words to truly understand them. The Buddha said all dharmas are Buddha dharmas. In Zen, when the Master hears this phrase, some of them have a great awakening right away. How is this possible? It is because their mind will already settle and just need something to trigger or shock their mind. Then all wrong thoughts would immediately be eliminated and all other thoughts ended and they woke up. That phrase, all dharmas are Buddha dharmas, is transcendent. Only the Tathagata can say this phrase, but you cannot. Why? It is because you all are still ordinary beings, who are still bounded by sight, sound, thought, and consciousness. These awareness are part of your brain functions and are not part of the pure mind. Hence, the Tathagata can say this phrase, but you can't. To us, all things in this world belong to the Dharma of this world. They are not like or belonging to the Absolute of Buddha Dhammas. If the Tathagata said it, then it is correct. But if you said it, then it is incorrect. Subhuti, the Tathagata said all dharmas are not real dharmas, just temporarily called dharmas. From the point of view of the pure mind, what are dharmas? What can be spoken by your mouth? Whatever you think or whatever you can speak of are just false thoughts. They are not absolute dharmas. The Buddha called them false dharmas because they did not come from your pure mind, but instead from your false views. The Tathagata said the Buddha's body is not big and tall, but temporarily called big and tall. Here the Buddha was referring to the reward body of the Buddha, which is as big as Mount Sumeru. Only the great Bodhisattva or higher can see the great Buddha body. The others won't be able to. Yet, the Buddha said this great reward body was just a name. 
There is nothing big and tall. Everything has its limit, and whatever has limitation has a false and temporary name. The Dharma body of the Buddha would truly be big and tall because it was immeasurable. Namo Mutsu Tekka Moni Phat.